Um, welcome to Saltwater Edge Tackle and Tactics Live, uh, Spring Tog. We are starting a couple minutes late because we're negotiating the sun that's chasing us across the room. So, good thing is there's a Costa case right there. So have at it if uh, if you get attacked by the sun. Um, so, uh, you know, our Tackle and Tactics blog posts are among the ones that get read the most. And so the idea of getting a group of, you know, guys a lot of uh, uh, experience together talk about one topic. Uh, it was an exciting uh, exercise. So really excited that you guys have, uh, you know, given us your time and, and uh, expertise today. So introduce people. Uh, Connor McLeod, Captain Connor McLeod, uh, owner of Tall Tail Charters. And uh, we'll hit up each of these guys at the end for some details of how you can reach out to them later. Uh, TJ Harris, uh, local man about town. Uh, T, uh, TJ's Tom <laughs> Jigs. If I was if I look at your hat, I wouldn't know. Right, there you go. So good for you. And uh, Century, I know you work with them. And then Dustin Stevens, uh, Rhode Island Kayak Adventures. So uh, three guys with a lot of tog experience. And uh, the way we kind of tee this up is we spend a, a minute uh, on species and habits, and then we'll dive into uh, some questions. And the questions are really not to ask 20 questions of three people and get 60 answers. The idea is to get a conversation going and dive in on a couple of topics, and you guys can you know, step up and lead that when you, when you see something you want to uh, sound off on, okay? Cool. So, uh, you know, blackfish themselves are a, are a prize game <clears throat> fish. They're technically tough to hook. Uh, they're bulldog fighters when you do, and on top of that, they're delicious. So, and it really is a spring thing that kicks things off inshore. Um, and uh, togs spend the winter uh, offshore and migrate in this time of year. Uh, they're daytime feeders, uh, larger juveniles and adults, will aggregate around rocks, boulders, reefs, mussel beds, and, uh, and wrecks. Um, studies have shown that larger females produce significantly more and better quality eggs than the smaller females. That'll probably come up along the way. Combination of slow growth and, uh, rate and strong tendency to stay near or return to their home reefs make them particularly susceptible to overfishing and slow to rebuild. We have a world-class fishery here in Rhode Island, and uh, it's great to see the local captains and clubs have been making an effort to really take a long-term view <coughs> Uh, by releasing the larger females. So the tog season recently opened here in New England, um, and for most of the Northeast fishermen, it's the first taste of fishing uh, uh, from a long winter off the water. So the tog are notorious for the way they hit your bait and, uh, and their preference from one day to another, um, even one side of the boat to the other. So I think uh, one of the things that will come out as a theme here tonight is it depends, right? Uh, <laughs> and so hopefully with these, uh, with these experts here, we'll, we'll get some... Uh, some ideas on, on what you might do in a situation where it's not going your way. And from this conversation, you might have some alternatives or a different way to look at a similar situation. So um, maybe I'll start with you, Connor. Um, what are some of the, what is your kind of indicator that it's time to start talking? Is it water temperature? Is it? It's definitely water temperature, mm -hmm. for sure. And everyone's focused on the dandelions and fishing shallow in the spring. Mm -hmm. But really, it's a metabolic trigger for the fish. So they say 50 degrees is a magic number. And that's subsurface temperature where the fish are actually swimming. Yeah, so, where they live. Right. On the bottom. On yeah. the bottom. So that's actually going to take longer. But the warmer, shallow water would warm up sooner, yeah? It, it, it would, but there's kind of a misconception where people think you have to go shallow right off the bat. It's colder than you think. So mm -hmm. you can still fish deeper than the, in the spring and get bigger fish. And the bigger fish move in behind the younger fish mm -hmm. so so you're watching the march if you will watching the march yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. they move in and they move back out in the fall yeah but so uh water temperature so 50 degrees is the magic number yeah and that's interesting because the temperature you get typically off a, a weather buoy or something like that would be surface temperature yeah of course yep. yeah okay interesting um yeah any thoughts that get you kicked off tj yeah, I and mean, the trout season. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Good idea. You know, same fifty degrees. Mm -hmm. You know, just sort of time time of year. You know, I mean, season opens April first, but I yeah. typically, you know, I'm not starting to to fish. For no, I, well, until... I, you watch the local captains; they don't hustle out there on April first. No, no, it's just too cold. Yeah, you yeah, know, exactly. So third week or so, third fourth week, you know, first week of May is when yeah. I really start kind of targeting. Now, Dustin guides, uh, operates a guide business out of kayak, so you work generally closer to shore. Uh, when did you start uh, tog trips this year, or have you started them yet? It's, I, but it's like April 25th right now. So I think my first uh, time going out for tog this year was uh, April 3rd, if I'm not mistaken. Ooh. 
Um, That's getting after it. Yeah. It is. <laughs> trying, you know, we, we buy all this gear all winter. And, yeah. You know, you just want to get out get there it and wet. try it. Yeah. And, uh, I didn't get any tug that day. I think my first uh, my first tug came up uh, maybe a week after that, yeah. I want to say. So, yeah, water temp and um, time of year, you know, that's mm -hmm. kind of what I look for, mm -hmm. similar to these guys. Is there something that's different about the tog fishing in the spring than uh, maybe the rest of the season? I'll start with you. Uh, in the fall, to me, they're a lot more aggressive. Um, you know, you can... Getting the feed bag on for a long winter kind of thing. <laughs> Put that back together for me. Sorry, man. Um, yeah, that's kind of the idea. Um, in the spring, you can, they kind of nibble a little bit, and if you miss them, they may not like come back right away while I find them in the fall. You know, if you miss a, hit, if you miss <clears> a hook set... Drop it right back down there. Eventually, you'll get another one. Yeah. Yeah. Probably a lot more bait stealers as well, but um, that's and that's also a difference. Less less bait stealers in the early part of the to tall season. Um, yeah. yeah, once it warms up, there's scuff. And yeah, all these other guys. Yeah, right. that makes it harder to fish uh, um, baits, really, right? Versus crabs. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I haven't done that much early season tog fishing. Most of my tog fishing's been with the jig, you know, and so. I, um, I'm curious about that in particular. This, this is the time of year to maybe use bait. Do you fish much with with uh, bait, or is it mostly crabs for you? Or uh, it's I, you know depends what's the on the reason. Yeah, depends on the season. Here we go. Well, yeah. so I gotta, it, it, it all depends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> one. That's one, one, one. Yeah, I mean, typically in the spring, I'm I'm fishing in less than forty feet. You know, in the mm -hmm. fall, I'm typically fishing most for the most part deep, deeper than forty feet. Yeah. Um, you know, so you can get away with a lot lighter jigs right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, half ounce, three quarter, one ounce. You know, those are those are the jigs that you're going to be mostly using in the shallower yeah. water, and current's not as much of an issue. Where in the fall, I'm using rigs. Anytime I, I'm not, I'm having a hard time holding bottom with yeah. two, over two ounces. I'm typically Deeper switching water, <laughs> more current, more, <clears throat> yeah. more 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 water moving through the column, and sure. that's when I'm switching over to rigs. You know, Got it's it. not. I wish it was a one-trick pony, but you, you have to be a you yeah. know a versatile. Multi exactly, you have to yeah. be very versatile and and realize, all right, it's time to switch to a rig. Yeah, you know, and so that uh, you know a rig would be you know for jigs and for um, you know and, and you can use uh, rigs, crabs, rigs, jigs. When's the occasion to use bait? Is there um, meaning like like blood worms? And yeah, or, or or various shellfish, razor clams, you know, steamers, all that, squid even. I mean, I, I know there's a variety of baits that people use. Is there one you make regular use of, you prefer, anything and, like that? I'm curious. Well, this is, this is a spring tog talk, mm -hmm. but in, in early fall, I use squid, and they, they love the squid first. Before it starts to get cold, like yeah. September, they, they go crazy for the squid. But in the spring, I go for crabs. They eat crabs year-round. Yeah. But guys... Do you say that the blood worms and the softer baits, because their mouths have been chewed? I read a bit about that. I heard it was going, I'm not so sure. sure. I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a theory, right? But yeah. you do have the blood worms hatching every few years in the spring, and, yeah. and there are an abundance of soft baits coming in. So right. I could see that, that makes some having sense. in the spring would make more sense. But yeah, but you get it done with, with crabs. Absolutely. Yeah, there yeah. you go. We don't, no, it's not complicated further. Right? Yeah, yeah. It works. So, the, but you typically would go out this time of year with a, with a, uh, with a rig and with a jig, oh, or yes. yeah. So how do you decide on a trip wh which to start with? Or this could be that depends. Have at it. Well, <laughs> it depends a little bit. I'm current, I guess, right? You yeah. made that point. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you'll you'll know right away if you're setting the boat up. You'll see is it ripping or not. Mm -hmm. So, but especially nowadays with like the jig craze, everyone is crazed by the jigs and the carbon fiber rods and high sensitivity, this and that. Yeah. So I always try and go jig first, get a better feel for what's going on down there. If I can't hold, kind of like what you know, TJ said, two ounces, two and a half ounces. Beyond that, you're kind of losing the properties of your jig. You're right. just, it's a it's a weighted piece of lead now. Just, yeah. It's a sinker. It's down a sinker as it. opposed to a uh, something you can teeter on the bottom and keep connected exactly. and, and, yeah. and use it for sensitivity. Have yeah. it down there in the tide. Gotcha. Have it actually fluttering. Actually play yeah. it as a jig. Yeah. The finesse aspect. The yeah. Finesse. Well, that's what's blown the, the, blown the thing up so, from right. you know, as a tackle shop owner. That's the where people have gotten super curious, yeah. you know, um, the the rod materials, the braids, the rigging, right. the the various shapes of jigs and all that. Yeah. But the uh, um, it's good. I I, I you know in, in preparing for this, it seemed like maybe the older stuff I read, but there was more in there about soft baits in the mm -hmm. spring and the soft mouth thing. And and 
I remember reading something else that said pike lose their teeth in the summer. I'm like, that makes no sense at all. To me, so I mean, I think the soft mile is probably yeah. out in that same kind of wise yeah. tail. Right. Well, you know? you know, the redneck pike too. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the um, in in the spring, I, you know, you were saying, I think, you know, that the, they're on the move, right? Their right. head, their it's water temperature, sure, but they're moving uh, inshore. Um, what's the you know you can um, how do you if if the smaller fish are in the lead and, and the bigger fish follow behind, how do you kind of keep track of what's where? Is it by what you find with your jig on the bottom, or is it uh, are you looking? You're going to move because you're on small fish. You're going to move. Do you find better ones? You know, is that it, what, how does that uh, um, that phenomenon of them being on the move work with where you might choose to fish or or how long you might choose to stay somewhere? Well, it depends, number three. Yeah, absolutely. okay. That's um, legit. That's absolutely. a legit one. That was a loaded question. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, the, the jig rig thing, for me at least, how I do it is is mainly tide dependent, mm -hmm. you know? Um, Back to ripping. If right. it's if it's ripping, you're going with the rig. But depending on where you go and as the fish are moving, in the spring, I go deeper than most guys do because I know they're behind. I know... The smaller fish. Yeah. Well, they're they're ahead. So I want to see yeah. the bigger fish are. Got it, got it. So I, I fish deeper until I'm striking out. Yeah. And I'll move around a few different spots around that depth. And if it's like, if the tide's good and the bite was good a few days ago there, and I know it's not, and the temp's, you know, it's starting to climb a little bit, I'll just move in. Yeah. Slowly a little more shallower. And, and, and is it, um, TJ, is it, you know, what is it, what's the relationship between temperature and depth? I heard this magic temperature that gets it going. Is there more, is it, is it, um, you know, that uh, that you find them in given depths and just gets progressively shallower to a point? Or, or is there, are they holding that shallow water into the, more the heat of the summer and that kind of thing? Is a change, when does the temperature depth thing kind of come to a conclusion, if you will? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> do I think it's number five, but yeah. you know, it, it all it all depends. Um, uh, I, I'd like to fish in the, a little more up the bay yeah. in the spring. Yeah. Uh, they, I found that they're moving up the rivers to spawn and stuff like yep. that, and that's why I kind of tend <laughs> to go towards the shallower side of it. And, and then um, the season just closes anyway, so it's sort of that's the logical conclusion, yeah, maybe. Yeah. It, it, exactly, yeah. and it's just sort of I mean, you can go by water temp and stuff like that, but I mean, if you're not dropping a thermometer down, you don't really know how deep it is, 20 right. or 30 <laughs> feet under. So, yeah. I mean, I just sort of go by what I'm catching. Yeah, you know, and I and I have a sort of a tendency to stick it out a little bit longer because I've found that um, you can sort of weed through the smaller fish and the bigger fish will sort of the, the smaller fish are always going to be a lot more aggressive. Yeah, and they're going to come in and generally get there first, right? Exactly, generally get there first, and and you know if you stick it out and if I mean it's been two hours and you've got one one legal fish out of thirty fish, then. You know, you can say, all right, it we need to make, make, make an adjustment. Right. Either go a yeah. little bit deeper or try a different piece of structure or, yep. or something. So, so um, uh, Dustin, when you want to make a move, what is, you know, you've gone through this dry spell or some small fish, not really <laughs> finding what you're looking for. Um, what's the, the logic to the next spot? I mean, what is it, you know, you've taken, you know, <clears throat> tides changing, you know, it's not as, it's either getting faster or right. starting to slack. I mean, what... What what is part of the decision process there? I mean, different from these guys. Because you're the, doing it in the, the yeah, kayak, that's right? what so we made the point earlier. You right. can fire it up and go right. to someplace new. You're right. you're so out of the kayak. I guess with the kayak, you're all, you're always trying to like uh, strategically launch somewhere where you know, given the conditions or what have you, that you can kind of move around to certain spots in close proximity because it takes us a lot longer uh, to get where we're going than mm -hmm. um, than a boat, obviously. So. Um, in most situations, if we're getting a bite, then we'll kind of stick it out there uh, for a while and just pick through the smaller fish and um, and eventually hope that the big ones come up. But like I said, it's if you're just focused on one piece of structure, like a wreck, for example, and there's not much else around there, then you're just, from the kayak perspective, you're just kind of stuck yeah, in that wreck until, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. and whatever happens, happens. <clears throat> so let me ask a follow-up. What is, you know, is there, you know, you, I'm sure you all have, Plenty of electronics, but uh, is it how small a piece of structure have you like come upon that was really productive? I mean, how small can they be to be like I got to make a point of this? You know, I got to make a waypoint here. I mean, if you see, I mean, if I see anything, I'll always mark it. And, yeah. You know, come back to it. You know, 
if I think it may be a productive, you know, talk spot or striper or whatever. But there are certain areas where they, you know, relate. They're just out there in the sand. You know, they're not on a piece, a piece. of structure. Yeah, yeah. Way out in, you know, we call them sand togs sometimes. They're yeah. just out there and you can hammer them on that one area and it's not related to anything. So if you're just using your electronics, if you see anything, it's always worth it to drop down and it's interesting because I had, you know, like I said, I know come from a deep experience here, but I'd always thought that it was started with being hard. That's how they got that face. Correct, right? Yeah. <laughs> from yeah. being, being yeah. in the, that all the, all the time. Yeah, yeah. Not, I would say 90% of the time they're around something, but there are some situations where you might think it's a group of sea bass or whatever, and you drop your, you know, drop an epoxy down and you can get a dog. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Early fall. Mm-hmm. All the time. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, TJ, I know you. I, I watched you do a talk on on shore fishing for fluke, and I know you do some shore fishing for tog. It's it's got to you know. Here's a kayak guy. Here's a boat guy. That's part of why I wanted to include you. What do you have for like um, how to size up a spot that might be something worth uh, pursuing? You don't have the benefit of electronics. Is the point I'm making? Um, yeah. You have uh, <laughs> things you're looking for. Uh, yeah, I mean it's one of the hardest things is access. Yeah, you yeah, know, totally. it's just just getting access and getting access to a spot that's not already shoulder to shoulder at sunrise. I mean, guys mm-hmm. come from out of state and they're there camped them. out in their cars mm-hmm. before the sun comes up, ready to go. So yeah. a lot of the sort of the more traditional spots, Stonebridge and, and areas yeah. like that, are, are pretty a lot more crowded than than I'd prefer to try to deal yeah. with. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I prefer to, to. So what is it about Stonebridge that makes it uh, not, well access, but after access? What is it that makes it a great tog, tog spot close to shore? It's the current, yeah? The ripping current? The current or? rubble there, I mean, it's, it's... It's an old bridge abutment, right? Yeah. For right. people that don't, don't know, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's really heavy, heavy structure, mm-hmm. you know, and it's pretty, drops off pretty good, you know, drops off 35, 40 feet. So really deep water within structure. distance, yeah. you know, really good vertical wall, um, you know. But I will try to go and, and, and do some scouting on big, big astronomical tides, you know, super low tide. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm looking for mussels. I'm looking for, for something for them to eat, you yeah. know, and pilings, <laughs> you know, pilings. I'm looking down and just seeing if, if there's. A, That's interesting. Yeah, it's a vertical of, thing. Yeah, and, exactly. and, the, and the, 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 the muscle bed is an area, not a mm-hmm. spot. Right. For, I mean, for that, sure. isn't that the, they can be pretty good size muscle beds, right? For sure. So right. I, when I'm fishing from shore, I always prefer to try to fish as straight down as I possibly can. You know, Wait, so. when you just said casting, I'm like, I thought yeah. to myself, that's got to be yeah. a tough well, way to stay connected, right? I mean, you know, people are casting a stone bridge and you can sit there and watch them lose rig after rig after rig. Yeah. You know? And I mean, there's places where, you know, Castle <laughs> Hill, it's great fishing, but you're going to lose rig after rig. And I've, you know, fished there with Daphne before and we've, yeah. we've caught some nice fish, but we probably caught three good fish and probably lost 15 pounds of lead and you know yeah. I think you know two dozen rigs you yeah. know and it, it starts to get kind of like what what the heck Why are we doing, doing this? you know <laughs> this is this is right. fun or you get on a really good one and it pops you off yeah. because it has that long scope with a line to run and yeah. swim so I'm looking for areas where I can typically fish straight <clears> down shorter lead on them you know yeah. can really turn their heads and get them out of the piling stuff yeah. like that Shallow, yeah but you started right you know? there you're on you have yeah. pilings to start yeah. with right so exactly that's something you really got to probably 15, put the boots to feet, them. yeah like 15 feet or less of yeah. water typically and i still use electronics i'll still use my navionics yeah um and and, and look and see what i'm what i'm fishing you know I, I don't have a sounder i can't tell what kind of fish are holding on it and stuff like that right. but i can certainly tell you know what 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 the transitions are and the depths and stuff like that you know use every google earth all that yeah. you know use use every yeah navionics is i mean for anyone it just seems to me like the place to start you know? and the fact that it's in your pocket absolutely uh for tide for weather for yeah you know uh detail it's pretty cool and now on top of that i guess every time someone passes over it there's Mm-hmm. an update of sorts that right. goes on which right. that blows my mind yeah. you know yeah, it's, in your pocket it's pretty yeah <laughs> they can hurt you though too because guys will put you know this spot has yep. this or they'll, they'll they'll mismark locations yeah. like yeah. that like the acid barge is, is mismarked on that yeah. that's not where the acid barge is yeah. for it. there's all sorts of waypoints that are off so yeah. Yeah, take it with a grain of salt, but <laughs> it's over yeah. there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It is still the best yeah. app on my phone. Though. Drop yeah. it. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Drop sure. your own pens. Yeah, drop, yeah. Your, <laughs> own, drop your own Drop your own. Trust no one. Drop yeah. your own pens. Yeah. Keep them private. Uh, so, um, you know, don't, uh, there's been loads of advancements in, in jigs over the past 
few years, and I, it already sort of came out that weight is 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 current speed. You know, you want to be the lighter ones you were talking about. Um, you know, sort of touching the bottom, keeping you, giving you direct connection, giving you the feel, taking all the advantages of what that type of jigging, which isn't really jigging, it's the crabs on the bottom. You're fishing with a jig and you're connected to it, right? That's that's um, has exploded over the last, I don't know, would you call it six or so years? It was a Japanese, I understood, um, uh, fishing method, you know, that's, that's come here and gotten pretty popular. Um, do you guys have any thoughts? Uh, we heard about weights already. You guys have any thoughts on color or something like that? You know, what you, where do you start? Do you start bright? Do you start dark? Do you, what do you, in, any? Uh, For me, it's whatever, whatever I grab at the moment. I haven't really found color to... Interesting. It doesn't matter yeah. as much to me. Um, I mean, from a rig standpoint, it's just no color involved. So it's yeah. just pretty much right. sinker and hook and crab. Uh, so I think if you put it in the right spot, generally, then you're going to get a hit yep. of some type. But it's, it's fun to mix colors up, you know, even with other species as well, you know, just yeah. to mix colors up. And see I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly something that the striper guy's got on the, you know, the top of his mind, sure. right? For you know, sure, for sure. You yeah. can, and you can go hog wild on colors, but, you know, you could say in the striper game, it's, you know, bone, it's parrot or yellow chartreuse and black or blurp one. They keep it simple. Right. But I didn't know if there was a simple way to look at tog jigs in terms of color. Yeah. But it's nice. Nice. Okay. Okay. I, I actually kind of do it almost a similar approach as I would mm -hmm. striper fishing. You know, dirtier okay. water, I'm using the brighter, the yeah, brighter yeah. stuff, the, mm -hmm. the glows, the whites, the oranges, the greens. Um, you know, and then on really nice, clear, sunny, light, light day, that's when I'm using the darker stuff. Uh, you know, and a, a lot of guys will say the color color doesn't matter at all, but uh, it doesn't matter until it does. You know, that's, that's what I like that to say. That is literally you know, Toby yeah. Lipinski's quote yeah. Yeah. Uh, from an article I read this yeah. afternoon, yeah. pre-gaming for this. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter till it does. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so having a few options mm -hmm. um, and, uh, um, you know, but I think, you know, you see... Um, there's a lot of different choices, you know, but uh, it seems it makes sense to me that, um, um, especially when you can't explain why um, <clears throat> today, you know, uh, BJ had, had uh, BJ had said a story, uh, told me a story that um, he uh, one two different two different fishermen, same boat, same you know they came well with a couple days in a row. One day this guy this rig this way crushed it. Next guy. This day, this rig, yeah, uh, he was on fire, and the other guy, you know, it was like it, 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 it was literally impossible to explain. You know, it's tough. I've, I've seen times where where it is like that, obviously. Um, but like for for jig colors, like yeah. nine times out of ten, if they're chewing, it does not matter what you put down there. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, the only jig I've seen bite marks physically on the jig itself are the bright glow colors, mm -hmm. um, and then. Non non glow colors. The only time I've seen it actually make a difference is in the spring, end of the spring when it's really getting warm. They're really starting to spawn. They don't like the bright colors. They will they'll, they they're annoyed by them. Hmm. So you you can get little little, little scratchy pesky on, yeah. on chartreuse, orange, yellow. But if you dull it down, it improves. Or you say they're annoyed by it. That's why they come to eat it. You mean or? Oh yeah. Okay. Right, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I misinterpreted. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's getting their attention. Got yeah, it. for sure. They're 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 pissed. They're gearing up towards the spawn. They don't yeah. like any aggressive intruders. Or... Yeah, interesting. Yeah, interesting. Um, so what would you say are the top couple attributes? We'll go right down the line. When you're looking at a, at a tog jig because there's a bunch in here, um, and <clears throat> a couple of people sitting here with big tog jigs. But if when you, what are the attributes you're looking for? Is it is it shape? Is it hook? Is it what are a couple? You know, do you have a any thoughts on that? No. I like a, a shorter shank hooks. Mm -hmm. I just feel that it's less, you know, hook out there, and most of the time they kind of eat the whole thing, so it's easier. To the feel. longer hook might mean here's the lead. Longer hook might be more leverage and things like that. A shorter hook means right. they. And I know guys that do well on both styles, so it's like it's all theory, right? Yeah. You know, it, the, it's the it depends type of thing. But yep. uh, I like uh, shorter shank hooks for the most part. Um, I prefer the football style uh, tall jigs or the so um, across like this. Or do you mean? Yeah, so the here's the whole style that hooks yep, up. Yep. And um, I think I've had kind of my best days on those. I don't really love the flat bean style as much, but yep. that's I've how seen, I learned. Too. I've seen that fall from favor just by watching the Absolutely. rack. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. and the whole idea of presenting the crab up, which I know both you guys do, 
what do you have for a couple things you you know you you make jigs you put a lot of thought into what attributes are important yeah. in your mind what I've, are they i've tried a lot of different hooks and uh, i really like a strong it's it's a it's a balance between the strongest wire to the thinnest wire yes. i want a thinner wire and i want it to be incredibly sharp um, that's why i go with undercutting points they hold the point for a long time the only downside to it is it's they're expensive they're crazy expensive, expensive right like but 75 the, cents a hook yeah, so yeah, i mean yeah that's the that's the and that's a carbon hook you you know those are going to be difficult to sharpen after the fact right so it's exactly. once they've taken a hit you're done i've seen exactly. some tog jigs come with with uh, stainless hooks that you can uh, put yeah. a file too. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. But so yes. your your thought is is sharp and uh, Sh sharp, a thinner wire, smaller yeah. hole going in, yeah. easier to penetrate those thick rubbery Not lids. Not fine to tooth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and but strong. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's no no shortage of sharp hooks out there that you can probably bend out pretty easily. But yeah. uh, something that's that's pretty strong. Um, you know. Average size gap, not not a big giant gap, not a tiny gap. Yeah, I predominantly will use green crabs, so you're going in, in one leg hole out the other. Mm -hmm. I like Asian crabs too. Um, they're generally smaller, yeah. They are, yeah, yeah. Typically, they're going to so be might smaller. Be, so, so it's, is it harder to put on some jigs than others? I mean, Asian crabs being smaller. Yeah, they're going to yeah. be a little bit, you know, further away from the, the head of the jig, a mm -hmm. little bit more out on the shaft, but it, it's still, you know, they still work. Yeah. So, how about you? It's just, yeah, so like what TJ said, that for me, I want a super strong hook with the thinnest wire possible for that strength. Um, Similar logic right there. Right. Got I, it. I don't, I will use Asian crabs, but I like generally slightly larger baits. In the spring, I'll use Asian crabs, and I want them to go through the sockets without breaking the shell up. Mm -hmm. I want my bait to be intact. Um, and like Dustin said, too, I also want a short shank. Um, I do like a wider gap, actually. Um, a, a standard wide gap. Um, I don't like O'Shaughnessy style of hooks and jigs. Um, but back to the thinner wire, I'm actually experimenting with uh, BMC Barbarian hooks, mm -hmm. which has what's called a technical locking curve. I think I know. It's a little bit of squared off in the back. It's, Is that yeah, the one I'm thinking of? Ho Hoagie's got them. It's got yeah, exactly. It's a little angle. Yeah. And um, they use them for tarpon fishing. So yeah, they use, them, they use them for like, we found them a couple years ago for like carp in rivers in the south you know what i mean it's like it's, literally a big bait hook it's and you settle you know the idea is that that angles where they uh the all the pressure is once they've once you've hooked up it's not no round right there's no round all the pressure is there it's it's got a higher higher set point on the hook than a standard loop hook yeah so in theory you get a faster hook set and it locks it into that first notch the kind of v or whatever it's not a v but it, yeah technical gotcha. locking curve yeah, yeah. and I, I experimented last year when i was you know making my own experimental jigs and i was seeing higher high, higher hookup ratios interesting but that hook is much much stronger in yeah, four yeah than uh, your standard loop you know round hook mm -hmm. um so i i might you know start busting those out a few a few times there you go um one of the uh where'd it go yes while we're on crabs um preference uh whole crab halves quarters legs no legs i heard you said you like your bait to be um you know complete if you will no crack to the to the shell yeah i um i can't give this information away unfortunately yeah. it yeah. costs money for this stuff gotcha then don't no, no, it's, <laughs> i like to build build the bite sort of build the aggression i'll mm -hmm. start with smaller baits halved almost exclusively halved. As I start to get bigger fish coming in, bigger hits, or, yeah. or, or we'll boat a seven, eight, nine pounder, then we'll start slowly transitioning to larger baits. And then once we're really on some big fish and the scratchy bite goes away and it's nothing but big bites, I'll put the big white baits down. Big white crabs, big yeah. green crabs, big spiders, give the big tog an opportunistic bait they want and they will go after it. Mm -hmm. If you don't, if you just flood the small fish with big white crabs or, or or whole spiders, it, it, you know, if you chew it apart, the big fish are less interested. If you build it up, then they, they really go after it. That's, that's very interesting because, I mean, I do think of the of, of how, how do you actually build a bite. And I, I would have thought, and it's, um, you know, not advanced thought, but you, the, the uh, using chum would help you do that. But in a way, you just said, yeah, it just floods the place with small fish. And you're trying to get through that, get past that. Right. Yeah. Well, there's nothing yeah. wrong with chumming them in, but once an opportunistic bait is down and you, you're getting the signs that there's bigger fish there, they will hammer it. Yeah. Like it's, 
Try That's the way. For sure. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, as far as it, any thoughts on building the bike for me that you guys? Yeah, I, I kind of actually like to start using rigs a lot of the time because I'm using two halves of a mm -hmm. crab on a Sammy rig. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the two short leads, two halves, and it's just sort of building it up. And then once fish are around and they're chewing pretty good, yep. and then I'm switching to a whole crab. You know, I like big, big, whole, chunky crabs, and, and I'll do halves on jigs for a little bit. It, a lot of it also depends on current as well. You mm -hmm. know, if it's a lot of drag, you're not you're gonna have a hard time getting down there if you're using a whole crab on a jig. So a lot of that depends on current and stuff like that. Um, I'm not really big on chumming. You know, it's gotta be slack tied pretty much, or I found or it's just, you're just pulling the fish off the piece in a way, I, I think. Um, you know, I mean, if you have a chum pot, some of those that, that are weighted, you could drop down to it. Um, you know, that's a, a pretty good method to mm -hmm. do it. Some guys have used, I've seen the brown paper bag tied to it. And you, Send it down to the bottom of the weight and yank it, and it blows apart. Yeah. And you know, it works. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it, it, it does. It does work. You know. Um, How about you, Dustin? Uh, you know, you you have to go back to that guy, and he can do his bait his own hook most of the time, right? Yeah. Uh, sometimes. Some yeah. People are, some people are squeamish on crabs. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll bait as much as necessary, but uh, in the fall, I like the half half green crab. I just feel that provides some automatic chunk because you're cutting it in half and all that stuff is kind of yeah. um, coming out in the water and um, like he said if you're on a good bite then you just try something new like if you're on a decent bite but it's consistent and you want to go for that big one then you can try something new with a bigger crab mm -hmm. or, or what have you so yeah the uh um so you mentioned the sammy rig um just for Folks, you know, that might not know what is the what is a quick explanation of the of the Sammy rig, and then I might ask these other two guys what your preferred rig is if it isn't. You know, I know yeah. there's 90 different ways to do there that, are. but yeah. I've heard yeah. Sammy's local and I've heard a lot about yeah. him and I've seen a couple. But you know, how would you describe yeah. it? What do you see the advantages of being? Yeah, you just have to give him credit by name because supposedly he's the man that designed it all. And yeah. it's, it's really popular around here. Yeah. So it's sort of a modified snafu rig, which is yeah. shorter leads. And I mean, you're, you're talking three or four inch long leads to either a three-way swivel or a big heavy duty swivel yeah. um, with, a, with a duo lock or a snap with your weight underneath it. Which so you're adjusting is, by current. Yeah, and then the... Yeah, every, everything is really tight and, and close together. Mm -hmm. Where a traditional snafu, you're gonna have a lot longer branches. and. Um, so how long are those leads, you said? Short, three, four inches. You yeah. know, no, no, definitely no more than four. Or they're going to start to twist and spin, and it's going to be a, a headache. And if, um, if I got this right, it's two into one crab. You can. A, two or no? two halves. You know, two halves. I, I'll, I'll do... Oh, so two baits on one Two baits rig. on one. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. There are some that are set up for... Yeah. Two hooks on one, no? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. wrong. Yeah, course, and you yeah. can. You know, the yeah. sweetheart rig and the slider rig and all those. There we go. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's so many. Well, when you start talking to the, to the Jersey guys, yeah. I mean, they they oh, are yeah. si scientists. Jersey, it, it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but typically, I'm going to be cutting all the legs off, mm -hmm. all the way up to the knuckles, leaving it so there's still individual holes. It's pr really critical to make sure you don't go too tight up to the body and cut cut it so it's one big giant hole because you're going to want to go in one and out the other and then I'm going to cut it in half so I've got two I've done that yeah, yeah, <laughs> I get it now yeah, yeah. <laughs> this year two, I won't do that thank two you two nice and <laughs> two two nice and tight to it you know yeah. those those uh those legs have to be short on the for the hooks otherwise it's going to twist and spin and, mm -hmm. and just get twist get and spin from so, current or twist and just all the way down yeah. and you know when with fish and get tangled and around the main line or just so is it when you say twist and spin would that be around the main line around, all the way around down themselves or? got you it know, twist up the two of them so yeah. the two of them i got you tangling and twisting so that's the reason like sammy did it short yeah Cool. Short and heavy too, 80, 80 pound leader. Oh, damn. You know? yeah. So they're short, really strong. Some people will use nylon coated wire and crimp it even because mm -hmm. it's really difficult to, to tie a knot with when you've got you that know, much in three or four pounds. inches and have it, have it seat and be still that short. You know, I'll snell one side. You know, I use uh, uh, owner Aki cutting points for yep. that. I'll snell to the hook side and then tie, um, you know, a, just a fisherman's knot and just seat it, seat that knot, but it's, you know, I'm working with, when you're tying it, you're like, this is going to be way too short, you know, and then you're pulling on it, you know, I've got a nail on my, down yeah. in my shop, and I just set it on it, and seat that knot really good, and it's, you know, you think it's going to be too short, and then it's, then it's perfect, it's like yeah. that, you've got two, 
you know, try not to hook yourself. I, I think all fishermen have frustration with not working with enough line yeah. or stuff that's too heavy yeah, trying to get right. a knot to seat. And yeah. just that's yeah. right if you, back there. If you try to do it with with a with a six six inch long piece of line, when you by the time you pull it tight, it's going to be four or five inches long, and it's going to be too too long. Yeah, right? you know, you have to start with a short short little piece, and it's annoying and frustrating. And the tag ends that small, and I'm grabbing one side with pliers. It's kind of the opposite of what so. uh, when I I think of a couple guys who just are very good at rigging. And one of the things they don't do is cheap out by using too little. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> they tie a good knot and it's, they cut off yeah, three yeah. inches because they yeah. worked with enough to start with. Yeah, You're right. starting it, off exactly. having to work with less because yeah. that's the at the end. That's yeah. what you want. It's the style of the rig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very cool. I mean, because I, yeah. I would necessarily reach for more. How about you for style of rig? Do you have a preference, or they mentioned it? I don't really know what the rig is called, but my friend, uh, my friend V, showed me like a, a rig a while ago, and it's. Like I explained to you earlier, basically your sinker's on the bottom. Um, you have a line out with a, like an octopus hook that sits right off the bottom. Your right right above the sinker. Right above the sinker. And it's kind of just like dangling in their face a little bit. And I think you can feel bites better with that. I typically would give that to clients more than I would a jig, just because it's more frustrating for them. But um, yeah, this is just a, a rig that a friend showed me. And, um, it still rig. works to this day. Yeah, yep, single that's, that's yep. like but not that's not my go-to, but the snafu, snafu is a go-to, but that's my second for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, I've used the double hook, and uh, people always told me I did it wrong because um, I used two halves of crabs instead of in one side and out the other or no. whatever. In what two hooks in one crab? Um, so yeah, I just thought two baits and two hooks are two opportunities to get a, yeah. to get yeah. a good fish. So, that's yeah. the versatility you get with the snafu rig. Correct. So that's yeah. why yeah. I prefer that. And it's funny you talked about short leads. Which when I time I do short too. I want beefy floral. I use floral because I'm you know mm-hmm. fancy, but mono's fine. I do too. Yeah, I do too. Mono's fine. Yeah, but yeah. the beefier it is, the more they kind of naturally stay away. But there's yeah. guys in the south they like long, short. I mean long, uh, uh, low pound test leader. Mm. Long though. Yeah. Wow. Seems like they'd, they'd be Eight all complicated on each other because floral is yeah. stiffer than the other materials, yeah. which That's is the plus to this. Yeah. Right. But I don't. In, in, I'm sorry. And in, in they're. Theory, they want it fluttering. Yeah. Uh, have you heard of this, yeah. Sal? Like, yeah. I've, uh, how are you supposed to get yeah. that bait down there and not yeah. knock it tangled up and flutter just right and still know what's going on? They must there. not have the, the stones we do. You know, the kind of yeah. bottoms exactly. we do. The stones. Yeah. 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 And, I, exactly. and I've actually seen them use circle hooks with it, too. Yeah. You know, yeah. Which, yeah. Is, too. which is it's crazy. Um, yeah, I use a floral when I tie my rigs, not for the visibility factor of it. Right. But just for That's about the third on the stiffness. list. Stiffness, yeah. abrasion resistance. Stiffness. Right. You know, I want it to I, stand out. So. Yeah, I and, choose floral. That's why, too. It's those yeah. other two reasons right. are ahead of the whatever yeah. the visibility yeah, right. is or isn't. Exactly. And if I can touch really quick on shore. So yes. that was what the, the what I use uh, primarily for my boat. But when I'm fishing from shore, I really like a high-low rig. Um, if I'm fishing, fishing straight down on pilings, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes I'll just... the the bottom one will be a little bit longer, you know, eight eight inches or so, my loop on the bottom, and then mm-hmm. a little bit tighter up top. And what's the separation? So, uh, yes. 16 inches. Oh, wow, that's you know? a lot. So, so that, that pretty, second, pretty fit, that amount, second you know? hook is well off the yeah. bottom, I'm, right? I'm, Yeah, I'm, I'm, it is. And I'm fishing around pilings and stuff like that. That's so, true, I mean, so they're you know, on, the, exactly. they're feeding they're, this They're way up too. and down their column. Yeah, they're not just focused on eating a muscle bed right off the bottom. Mm-hmm. You know, they're... They're up, all up and down, so Got it. I could get a lot of fish on that top hook too. Surprisingly, I would say speaking so. of rigs, just never be afraid to try those like quirky rigs that you may see in a tackle shop because they work. Like I've seen a, a lot of different stuff, and you know it all works. Yeah, it's oh, simple yeah. crab yeah. hook weight. Like yeah. it's it's really that simple. Don't overthink it. Yeah, right. exactly. Just talk. Guys, guys oversimplify it a lot for sure. Yeah. The um, one of the questions that came in. Uh, through uh, Instagram, is any noisemaker on rigs, beads, etc.? Any thoughts on that? <laughs> only, only, <laughs> only really jerks do that in their target. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've just started incorporating a couple rattles in at a request of, uh, of, a, of a local sharpie on the island. Mm-hmm. Uh, Larry Rainey asked me, sure. you know, he said, why don't you try to put some rattles on them and see how it works out? And I incorporated some uh, glass rattles inside of them and uh, you know, we're, we're still testing and I mean, they're really inquisitive animals, you know, yeah. I mean, they hear crunching and they hear stuff like that. I mean, it's, you, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, you know, I mean, you're, you're not jigging 
a, a, a jig. Yeah, you know, you're, right. you're you're pretty much there on the bottom. Some guys will give it a little bit of you know lift and sort of sort of creep it along the bottom, but it's not like a slow pitch jig. You know, right. when you're jigging it. Um, but my sort of theory on that is, if it's slowing down and you're it's been a few minutes without a, without a bite, you just put a bait down. You know, it's not a lack of bait. Um, you know, just give it the rod tip a little lift and so just give it sort of that that audible. Mm -hmm. You know, just to. It up. You know, make fix it up. And, and, and Just try. Isn't part of the, the strategy of the jigs and the direct connection that you have that you can, you know, use this tabletop as an example. You can investigate different parts of it because you have um, such a, you know, you're able to move your your jig a little. Um, you don't want, like you said, not jigging like per se, mm -hmm. but you can block it a little mm -hmm. bit, right? Yeah. And and um, the uh, uh, <clears throat> it was, it, it, to me, that's one of the things that I saw as a as an advantage, um, and then also as the current picks up, to keep that same kind of connection, how do you adjust? Do you adjust in half ounces, or or how does that? How do you work with that? What's guidance you give everybody else on how to um, know that you've got the right um, kind of jig or weight jig, literally the weight right. at the given time? That's a really good question. That's probably like the million dollar question, and. I, I might fish it a little differently than a lot of guys do. A lot of guys do prefer how you're saying, pick it up, feel the bottom. It's almost like a yeah, a, a feeling point of where you are. Yeah, that, you, you know, that's what I think of it as. Not a lot of experience, but keep going, please. <laughs> I, if it if it's straight up and down, and I can it's you know if I pick it up and I clunk it, it's too much weight. I want it to be down there and mm. kind of fluttering. If I know I'm in the strike zone, if it's, yeah. if it's not you know totally scoped out, and I know it's down there. I will slowly flutter it. I will try and act like it's a crab. And mm -hmm. if I, if the tide is slowly picked up and I was previously on the bottom and it's just kind of picking my jig up, I don't switch yet. I wait until I can see there's, it's, it's all scoped out. I'm not getting hits. I know I'm out of the strike zone. Then I'll switch. I want as light as possible to maximize. Yeah, at, every, at every point along the way. Exactly. Interesting. And just go up Absolutely. in whatever increments you have. Half ounce, you know, three quarter. Mm -hmm. If you have, you know, just nudge it up. Yeah, you know? I think that uh, there was a big um, tog caught in Connecticut in the last week. Um, kayak tog. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. yeah. Crazy. smiling over there, the yeah, kayak I mean, guy. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, I heard it was a really, relatively small jig, too, in terms of weight. Yeah. Um, yeah. What did you guys hear about that in terms of the, the, the uh, wasn't it bit, like less than an ounce? I think yeah. it was a one ounce. I think it was a one or one, one ounce. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. maybe bigger yeah. than I thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's still on, on the small scale, though. That is, though. Yeah. The, the weight of the uh, oh, one and a half. One ounce would be on the smaller yeah, side. Of yeah, opinion, yeah, yeah. It's maybe it's what I see selling here, and yeah, it's more of the lighter stuff because that's what I think people are thinking. Mm -hmm. Jigs like you guys have been describing, and then a little bit faster current, deeper water. They're onto rigs, and you know that's that's you're buying the pieces to assemble that. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, as we talk, I had one note to myself about um, we talked about bait rigs. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on the sinker? Is it strictly a bank sinker? I, you know, I know folks make flat ones and things like that. Have you found that stuff to be uh, helpful um, or a time to reach for that? Is there a reason? I, I do prefer the flat bank sinkers. In fact, I casted a ton of flat banks this year just for fall tugging. Yeah. I feel like they, especially if you're on a gnarly you know, piece of structure, some a serious ledge or a you know, you know, the size of a big boulder where you can yeah. feel yourself dropping off a lot. Right. The flat banks do stay up, you know, better. And they get hung up less. You know, like, more often than not, I'm going to hung up on my sinker than I am the actual hook. That's mm -hmm. actually snagging me. Pull right. up. You know, they got no hooks left and you got no sinker left. So I do prefer the flat banks to the yeah, you know, me standard too. banks. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I want to, we have them in here and, and it made perfect sense to me. But they don't uh, seem to sell anywhere near at the rate of the of the uh, you know of a bank sinker. Yeah. And if it's tog season, you think that would be a perfect reason to reach for them. Mm -hmm. Well, keep yeah. them in stock because popularity is going to go up. There you go. Well, that's to yeah. me it made plenty of sense because right. the you know you have something that's bigger at the bottom, it's easier to get yeah. uh, hung up. It, it, I like well, it rolls versus yeah, true, good point. Flat, yeah. You know? yeah, I like them for fluking too. The, yeah. yeah, good to know. Um, so, uh, we've been at it a bit. Um, we've answered a couple questions that have come in, um, uh, without, um, maybe a little bit on the typical rod and reel setup that you use, um, for jigging 
Um, you know, what is it, the attributes of the rod? You know, what are you looking for in real? I mean, you know, if we were talking about albies, it'd be retrieve speed source. <laughs> what is there that you're looking for in um, the tackle you choose? You know, if you want to say exactly what it is, that's cool too. But, you know, just guidelines for people that are curious about this. Um, are there any things you've found that you've kind of got to have to, 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 to uh, hit the spring tog with, with jigs? With jigs specifically? Yes. Uh, in the spring, I mean, this is, this is probably one area where it is different than the fall because you are fishing in shallow water. Mm -hmm. You don't, pulling them out of the holes isn't as much of a struggle as it is in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, but generally my tog jigging rod is, you know, something that's got a good backbone, a, a, a low parabolic start, so a very fast tip and most of the backbone of the rod is firm. For yeah, me. for fighting. Firm, but you have the sensitivity. Um, you know, Ted Zach. Yep. You know, yep. you know, I know just did a bunch of rods for you and building me yep. uh, American Tackle Nanofine, which is a you know carbon fiber uh, cousin essentially. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, the first two thirds of the blank is cross wrapped, and then it's spiral wrapped. Your stiffness. I believe. Yeah. And it's if you hold it up, it's a Brand new. I've never used it, never even seen this technology, but if you hold it, you're like, there's no way it's, it's rated for what it's saying. It's crazy, crazy, crazy strong just holding yeah. the rod. Yeah, I, yeah. I can't wait to, Excellent. to feel it, yeah. That sounds great. TJ? Yeah, um, a little a little biased, but uh, I, my my jigging setup yeah, <laughs> <laughs> is That's a cent century weapon. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the 7.6 weapon. It's mm -hmm. really versatile. How about length feel? So. Something like that? Uh, jigging? Yeah. Yeah, seven to seven, six. Okay, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Just, that sounded long. That's why I was yeah. wanted to follow up. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like a longer rod. You know, I've, some people have asked me too, you know, why why are you using such a long rod? Um, and well, in my head, seven, six isn't really that long. Mm -hmm. You know, over eight feet would be considered long. Yeah. But um, I, I want, I really want that extra length too, so I can get big a, real, a big, big sweep, you know, uh, turn, try to turn that head and get them out. Um, and a shorter rod's going to handcuff you on that. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. exactly. Like a f four thousand class spinning reel, Shimano, you know, yeah. spinning reel. Uh, the Stratix are great. Stella, Twin Power, all you those. got all so, those. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, some guys like the three three thousand series. I've just found that it's I've you know made them make settled some on ugly the four, noises. You said? What's that? You said you settled on the four thousand. Yeah, I like a four thousand. Five thousand is a little big, a little heavy. Yeah. Um, I found that four thousand balance is really light with it, really nice with the rod. It's mm -hmm. light enough, and mm -hmm. um, three thousand is just. I've used a three thousand a few times, and it's made some pretty ugly noises after a couple yeah. of big fish. And <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I'll save those for Albies. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, how about you, Dustin? Uh, same thing. Uh, kind of a heavier duty rod, fast action, um, seven foot. Mostly for me, sometimes I'll play around with seven six. Uh, for jigging in an area where there's not a lot of structure, I like to use the spinning rod. I just feel it's fun. Mm -hmm. um, if you're on, you know, some really heavy duty stuff, then I like to use either conventional or bait casting style reels. So oh, really? Yep. Yeah, I mean that's kind of that's uh, a, a, a tweener on the uh, traditional heavier stuff of the of you know. Rigs of the past, right? right. And, and right. It, yeah, so the some of those level, uh, some of those uh, low profile uh, style reels, right? Yeah, or, 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 or like Daiwa Alexa or yeah. um, the Tranks, you know, yeah. those yeah. are good bait casting style mm -hmm. reels. Now, yeah, what, what is the um, um, what is the uh, um, level, the kind of uh, stopping power you guys are looking for in terms of drag pressure? Is it that's a good question? Um, so I fish with a bunch of different guys you know clients and stuff they're yeah. really good tar jiggers you know the yeah. jersey guys new york guys that's take, what i hear they take it really serious yes they're that's really, what i hear they're really good at jigging yeah and they've taught me a lot of stuff um and some of the better guys that i fish with they lock down the drag like when i like I, I tried their rods and i said dude this, yeah. all right it's it's rocky bottom but like loosen the drag up a little bit and literally like we've gotten some like 10 12 pound tars that day and like they barely pull drag their main prerogative is pull it out. Get it so out. Yeah. if I could just estimate, lock down like 15, 17 pounds. Yeah. But me personally, I like something in the middle where it's got mm -hmm. the strength. I can still play the fish a little bit. Yeah. You know, if I got to turn them mm -hmm. and they're in a hole, they're in a hole. You know, right. it's, um, that's the game. It is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. being said, those guys that lock it down, they land fish. They, they can well. fish in the boat. Yeah. So. yeah. I'm using 30 pound braid for my spin setup. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm probably fishing 12 to maybe 15 tops, you yeah. know. Um, I just, 
I don't really like going over 50% of the line's rated strength. Right, and, right. You know, point. For, for conventional, though, when I'm fishing rigs, um, I'm using a uh, Pro Togger 710 mm -hmm. Century, Osha Jigger 1500, typically 50 or 60 pound Max Quattro, and then, you know, I've got 80 pound leader for my rigs, you know, a 60 pound top shot. <laughs> On that and my drag is pretty pretty that darn is tight. That's a technical you know. <laughs> it's, setup right there. You know, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. yeah, it's good setup. Yeah, yeah. sounds you know, great. I, but my I fish a but pretty. the whole rigging of the top shots and all yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. So how long's the leader for you guys, just in general? I use long. I use ten foot. Mm -hmm. To um, a what not? FG knot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. FG. Alberto. Yeah. 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 Same. It's yeah. Yeah. Low, yeah. Profile, low profile. Yeah. Tiny guides. For sure. Yeah. Some similar for you. Yeah, I actually specifically asked for a little bit bigger guides, you know, especially on my spin. You know, yeah. on a lot and a lot of the, the century spinning rods will come with a size six guide. I prefer a size eight, just a little bit bigger. Yeah. Um, you know, just take, takes that knot, even an FG, a little bit, a little yep. bit, yeah. you know, a little bit better. But yeah, yeah and same size leader, 10, 10 and 12 feet, you know. Um, um, with that Nemefine rod, that, that Ted built me, he is uh, specifically doing an eight, eight, mm -hmm. eight size guide for that. Yeah. Um, and with the leader, uh, I, I adjust as I go, but you're fishing, you know, rocky bottom. Yeah. So I'll just, I'll give it a good shape up. I'll cut it. Once I'm down to about, you know, three foot, four foot, or even, you know, five foot, I'll retie. Yeah. Got it. So yeah. you got a long leader that can get you through most of the day. Yeah. I also have a six, well, three to six foot leader. Mm -hmm. um, and my main line on the spinning rod is probably 20 pounds in some situations. Mm -hmm. Um, on a conventional or bait casting rod, uh, 30 to 40 pounds is great. Yeah. Uh, leader wise, anywhere from 30 to 40 pounds is it for the most part. Got it. Um, <clears throat> we've been asked a question here um, about uh, anchor drifting. Um, is there more to that question? Um, is it like what situation would you choose to anchor, choose to drift? Uh, my assumption would be from what you know, what I do know about this, that you'd want to be on something, stay on even spot lock it if right. you could, mm -hmm. right? Isn't that? Uh, yeah. The drifting, general. drifting would be very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good be great for, for me, great for business for both of us. We'd <laughs> yeah, sell a lot yeah, of jigs yeah, for sure. if everyone tried to drift <laughs> over a piece. But yeah. Drift on pieces. Yes. <laughs> but uh, I have found uh, a, a means to the craziness. But it, when you're swinging heavy, throwing a single anchor you know, right off the bow, you can pick up a good bite if you're able to jig with the bottom as you're as you're swinging. If it's not too crazy mm -hmm. and if you know for me with you know clients on board generally there's a big learning curve there but if guys are, are good and know what they're doing you'll entice bites by by moving the bait a little bit and now is the, when you say um, um know what they're doing that is to like uh, keep it as much as possible directly beneath you or not scoped out as you described earlier boats moving your your jigging can be scoped out as a result of that right you're talking about controlling it in that uh, as the boat's moving, having good control over your jig and where it's located, yeah? As the boat's moving, you're yeah. kind of at the mercy of the boat. You can, right. Your weight is what it is. So yeah. you're, you're going to scope out a little bit if you're, if you're going. But if, if the depth is changing and you're going up and back over a piece, it's to be able to, you know, kind of finesse that jig up and over uh, it and yeah. not panic when you get hung up and, oh, I'm snagged and yeah. I'm done. It's, yeah. you, know, you know. Doing it right, you feel, in some ways, you feel like you're kind of, Painting the bottom, you're like drawing Absolutely. a map, yeah. if you would. Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. It's That's totally different for us, though, as far as the drift versus um, yeah. anchoring. Yeah. Uh, some of us anchor. I always have. I have anchor trolleys on all of my kayaks just in case. But I'm more so playing around with anchoring this year than what I have in the past. So most of us, uh, from the kayak perspective, we do drift mm -hmm. um, unless you have a motor on there with spot lock, which there there are those out there. But, you know, for the most part, you're just kind of nose into the current or the wind, whichever is taking you away, and you're just using your pedals to, to try to stay on the mm -hmm. spot the best you can. You're watching that house over here and that bridge pile yep. over here to, yep. yeah, yeah, the old-fashioned yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. 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 Range, range. <laughs> That's great. You're getting a nice so, workout just trying to yeah. human spotlight mm -hmm. yourself, but it works. It works well. That's cool. Yeah. That's, That's cool. crazy. Yeah, no, I'm, not, I'm not really afraid to swing when I'm, when I'm fishing in my boat. You know, I mean, if it's a, a large piece of structure, you know, and I've, 
I don't mind it as much, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of times I'm, I'm pitching that jig out 15, 20 feet. I don't have to fish straight down. You know, I'm kind of exploring that it's, it's yeah. you know, it's, yeah. it, we I always, just, for, sorry, I should be interrupting yeah. you, but I feel like for me, when I do that, that's where my problems come. Yeah. So I'm much more, you know, hearing, hearing, you, guys, it's, yeah, hearing yeah. you guys, and I think that I, I got to stick to that because yeah. I can't, I lose yeah. my, my uh, feel. Well, you know, kind of comes, a lot more experience. Yeah, it comes with experience yeah. and, and just, you know, and, and not cranking on it really hard and wedging it in there. You know, I yeah. mean, I, I might lose a jig a trip. You know, it's just, you, nice. you, you just work it and you can typically bounce it out of there if you just yeah. stick at it. It may take you a couple minutes, um, but it's just important to not, not wail on it right away. But I mean, I'm, I'm exploring around that piece of, if yeah. we're on a small piece of structure, a wreck or something like that, you know, that's when I'm trying to fish as straight down as I can. That's when I'm resetting my anchor four or five times until I'm right on top of it, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm you know, straight down on it, you know, but if we're fishing out, you know, off, off the reef or something like that, mm -hmm. where it's a little bit more open, I don't really mind <clears throat> swinging with wind and tide and stuff like that and sort of yeah. ex exploring around you, you know, cause, it is a game of inches at times, and sometimes yeah. you can swing into that really good spot, and uh, you know, and you may even consider pulling up and resetting so you will lay into that spot mm -hmm. a little bit more. Mm -hmm. you know. And there, there's tricks to that too, because you know, being the blue collar single anchor guys, mm -hmm. if you don't have the double anchor tree or if you don't have a spot lock, you gotta get creative with how you stay on the spot. Mm -hmm. And there are ways to do that. You can manipulate the wheel, mm -hmm. you know, try and keep your rudder hard over one way, and it's not always the the, the the direction you'd think so mm -hmm. experiment with your rudder you know position yeah. and see where that swings you you can also bridle your anchor line if you're if you're swinging hard one direction you know you're off your piece mm -hmm. wait for it to come back come up on your anchor line so say you want to pull the boat to starboard a little bit pull up on yeah. your anchor line about 15 20 feet tie it off on your midship cleat mm -hmm. and then tie a bridle line with like a you know barrel hitch or something another mm -hmm. line going from that part of your anchor line yeah. back to your midship cleat and and by the time you release it, now your, um, you know, your anchor point is on half of your boat and not the center. So I you see. immediately knocked off a lot of that swing. And I you, see. you can really, yeah. it, and then you can increase the size of your bridle. You can really kind of get a much closer to where you want to be with a you know, single anchor. You can do a show on this. <laughs> there's a <laughs> science. There yeah, is a real yeah. science yeah. to anchoring for, for black fish. Yeah, I, I, I and, fished with a guy uh, one day, and that's what I was just all about yeah. the work he was doing to just yeah. dial it in with two. He yeah. had two anchors yeah. with well, the uh, tree off the, off the yeah. front. Yeah. yeah, I mean you, you can really lock in that way. Yeah, yeah. you can so also throw the, an anchor off your stern too, which is not not as ideal. But if you can get if you can line up directly in line, and when you're setting back your anchor, and you're exactly where the, the tire of the wind is going to set you, you come back on your spot and make sure your stern anchor is exactly in line. You come back on it; it can keep you pretty tight. You can mm. get pretty close just doing that. Sounds like a guitar string. Yeah. Right. <laughs> just don't ever pull it from your stern. Yeah. Yeah. Never. No, yeah. Down you go. Up, yeah. Down you go. Yeah. Um, so uh, we've been talking here for. A, there you go. Here on down the line. The. Um, the uh, so uh, final bit of Tog Spring advice uh, it could be a recipe, you know, <laughs> but i uh, curious what you guys uh, might have for um, if there was a tip or a, a resource or something you'd tell somebody who's who's interested in, in learning more, you know, um, what would you uh, um, what would you make as a recommendation, um, you know, to uh, to somebody who wanted to learn more? Is there something you read or a resource you use that, that they should uh, be familiar with? I would say just watch what's happening around you, number one, especially mm -hmm. if you're from shore or kayak, you're kind of in close proximity from boats, you're kind of far, you know, ideally you give each other uh, more space so you can't yeah. see, but just watch what's going on, talk to guys, uh, try different stuff that you see, like I said, as far as uh, rigs and tackle shops, mm -hmm. different style jigs, um, just always, always experiment, you know, there's plenty of resources on YouTube, um, but the best teacher, in my opinion, is just getting out there and yeah. Being on the water, trying different stuff out, yeah. and seeing what works for you. Yeah, yeah, hands yeah. down. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, watch the highliner. You know, if you're, I fish all. I fish from shore. I fish yeah. on six pack charters. I fish on party boats. I love it. I, I yeah. get around. Yeah. So, the guy that's catching the most fish, you know, watch him. Watch Talk what he's him. doing. Talk yeah. to him. Ask questions. You know. Um, some guys are a little more private and may not want to share it with you, so you're right. going to have to do a little bit of investigation on your own. But look at his rig. Yeah. You know, when he goes inside the cabin to grab a <laughs> yeah. sandwich, walk by his rod, and be like, oh, oh okay. It looks like a slider rig with a red bead on it, you know, and then go home, YouTube it, 
figure yeah. out how to do it, you know. Um, and and I would say a, a big thing too is book a local charter. Yeah, I was you know, gonna these, I was gonna close with that. Yeah, the answer's right sorry. here. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, I feel that way. I, for me, I, I uh, got invited out a couple years ago with, with Chris Parisi, and it just blew my mind in terms of yeah. like. That was the guy with the two anchors, the whole, yeah. all that was going on. I yeah. was just coming too fast, yeah. you know, I, and, but I'm eager to, to do more of it, you know, yeah. because it's really got uh, just the, the layers of, you know, it, we, we were joking about how many times we're going to say it depends, yeah. right. but it's certainly, you start in a better place if you start with this level of experience, right? I mean, Absolutely. one of the things, what do you describe of like tossing your rig out and you're exploring? Mm-hmm. I'd be horrified. Yeah. You know, because I'd, yeah. I'd be lost out there. I'm yeah. really focused. You can see over time yeah. how getting better at that. Just, you're going to cover, yeah. you're going to know more. You're going to cover more. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, take take advantage of this, you know, for the local guys on this yeah. island. We have some of the yeah. best charter captains, Agreed. you know, in the state, you know. Connor, BJ, you know, Robbie Taylor, mm-hmm. Mike Littlefield. I love going out with those guys. I have my own boat, you know, yeah. and I still book charters with these guys or go out and fish with other friends that come up from Jersey. And I watch them. I talk to them, you know, and it's just I always learn something. You know, mm-hmm. I've been fishing for 40 years. and I, Every time I try to go out and try to learn at least something, you yeah. know, just watch and watching different techniques. I may not use the same technique that the guy's doing, but it's just interesting. You know, you know, what it just I, adds to repertoire. What I noticed with uh, fishing with captains, I remember thinking of this is, fishing with Corey, Corey Petrasic, he wouldn't know mm-hmm. anything. But um, his eyes are up the whole time. He's tying a knot that I'd have to stare at. Yeah. Well, you know, because he's taking, yeah. you know, it's all every day to him, and he's taking in the data. I mean, all you guys are yeah. nodding while yeah. I say because right. that's, that's how it is. That that's level true. of experience shows you more opportunities. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Hey, let's uh, let's uh, hear for a quick sec about the tog from last year, the, the record tog. Which, which one? The, the one I saw the picture of, the guy from Jersey. Right, yeah. well, you know which one. Oh, right okay. Come on. Fine. 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 Oh, you, you, got me. Go. you got me. You got me. But uh, yeah, can you a little bit about that story? How did how'd that come about? Yeah, the I mean, parts that you feel comfortable. Yeah, okay. yeah, I mean, I'll, right. I'll give you the short the short version. But sure. Thanks. You know, Kidu Kali Paul is a hardcore young fisherman, seventeen. You know, he's re- really passionate. He comes on the boat and he's got like seven rods. And I'm like, we just don't have the room for seven rods. Well, you got to pick one. He's like, all right, well, I bring my ultralight tackle trout rod. I was like, all right, cool. Well, we're going to try and get some bigger fish. He's like, well, I got my big beefy conventional rod. He's like, go with that one. Yeah. And uh, so he threw away the light tackle trout one. And uh, and we're fishing. The bite's picking up. And he just switched to the rig. You know, as we were saying before, the current we were, picked up or something. Current picked okay. up, and we had already we we're kind of building the bite too. You know, so it's kind of everything's kind of falling into place, and we're just now opening the the you know white crab uh, buckets. And he mm-hmm. put the first white crab on after a kid on the bow just about got spooled. Like I've never seen on tar before, like ripping, and then just right to the rocks, dumped them immediately, and then Paul dropped it down, and uh, he thought he was hung up, and I'm. I was uh, undoing a tangle with two other guys in the boat. I'm looking at his rod tip twitch. I'm like, crank. He cranks, and there's a big twitch. I said, crank on it. He cranked tight. He's like, it's a fish. It's a fish. Yeah. And, you know, we caught lots of tog. Nothing like that, obviously. You don't, we don't generally get tog that size. You know, mm-hmm. The south, they grow faster. They get bigger ones. And uh, so he gets it up, and it did four or five runs mm-hmm. up and down. And it finally came up to the water, and we saw a color. And it's like it was gaping white brown blur and he dumped again like 30 40 feet like a striper I'm like yeah. that's not we're not used to this but you know paul was steady and slow and he did good on the rod and great. a client had the net and i'm like dude i would never let someone else net this fish well i'm not gonna take it out of your hands for bad food you so yeah do not miss this net and then <laughs> the uh, other charter client got it and saw it on deck it looked like a cartoon and yeah wow it was cool. It was very cool. I remember seeing it. I remember seeing it when it, it was everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It was a cool day, man. You know, yeah. you fish every day trying to find a fish like that. And yeah. I, I wish a Rhode Islander got it, but, you know, yeah. you know for an out of state guy, Paul. Right. 17 year old <laughs> dialed in yeah. kid. That yeah. sounds awesome. I'm passionate yeah. about it. Like, totally. I love it. Don't get from there 20 pounder. Yeah. 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 I love it. So as we wrap up here, um, I want to go down the line. Uh, where can people go to learn more about you, book a charter, find the jigs? Dustin? Uh, you can go on my personal Instagram page, Dustin Goes Fishing, um, or my business page, Rhode Island Kayak Fishing Adventures on IG, um, my website, rikfa.com. <coughs> it has all the kayak cool. charter information. Um, pretty much it, I think. Cool. We can get all that in the notes, too. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, DJ. 
Yeah, uh, I run New England Saltwater Fishing Facebook That's page. Right. Uh, welcome to join on there. I sell my jigs off of there and um, in Crafty One up in Portsmouth. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> the uh, but the no no chartering. Uh, you're uh, a captain. You're I'm, busy. I'm a, busy. On I'm, the I'm a yacht business. captain. Uh, yes. Former charter light light tackle charter That's captain. I thought, yeah. But uh, no, I'm save that time for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, good yeah, call. I, I enjoy it. I, I like the separation yeah. a little bit. You know? <laughs> so I, I enjoy fishing a lot more. Yeah. Uh, so. You can you can follow me on social media, Tall Tales Charters with a Z. With a Z. Yeah. Z. Um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, TallTalesCharters.com, and we do have our Tall Tales Tog jigs, which mm -hmm. we've been, you know, trying to get dialed in, and we're we're pretty happy with. Excellent. Um, got them here, Crafty One Customs, uh, Lucky's. Sam's might start carrying them uh, in Ocean State up in Providence. Excellent. It has them too. So, so excellent. Yeah. Well, this is uh, I, I really, I you know, uh, I was excited when we um, decided to do this because I uh, myself been more and more interested in it, and I just the time I get to spend with guys with this kind of experience just <clears throat> gets me more excited and gives me puts more ideas in my head. So I'm sure you've done that for all these guys out there too. So. I want to thank you all for uh, coming tonight. Yeah. Let's enjoy some thank cold you. pizza. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.